Good afternoon. Thank you for attending the information session spotlighting nursing, radiography, and respiratory care for CT State Community College. Our presenters today are Connie Hodgkins, nursing director at Northwestern Campus, Nancy LaRose Shovak, program coordinator for respiratory care at Manchester Campus, and Susan Morrison, program coordinator for radiography, also Manchester Campus. And I'm Sarah Hendrick, director of selective admissions for CT State Community College. At CT State Community College, we offer several health career programs, both associate degree programs and certificate programs. They're all listed here, but just some examples are nursing, occupational therapy assistant, radiation therapy, radiography, surgical tech, respiratory care, among others. And then for certificate programs, we offer dental assisting, we offer radiography, CT, MRI, and mammography. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Connie Hodgkins to talk to you about our nursing program. Thank you, Sarah, um, and welcome everybody. And thank you for your interest in CT State. So I have a little or a little pictorial here, really talking about the characteristics of a nurse. I think we all know nurses. We have all encountered nurses in our life. And these are some of the skills that nurses really are required to have. And communication is one of the top skills. Um, it is vital for providing safe and efficient patient care. You have to have a willingness to learn. And that's a lifelong willingness to learn because we never stop learning. Critical thinking is also one of those skills that is vitally important. You have to be able to take in a lot of information, filter through it, and then decide what is important and how you're going to use it. Attention to detail. Nurses need to pay attention to every little detail. You need to be able to assess your patients. You need to look at a lot of information and again, filter through that information. Time management, as you can imagine, anybody who's ever been in a hospital or in a busy doctor's office can, can understand why time management would be a critical skill. Problem solving skills, again, that goes along with that critical thinking. You have to have a sense of humor. Sometimes things are really stressful and then a sense of humor gets you through that. You also have to care. You have to want to be a nurse because you care about people and you want to make people feel better. And you have to be committed to the profession of nursing. You also have to have some empathy and leadership, stamina, because you work long hours and sometimes the work is really hard. Um, experience. It's always best if you have some kind of an experience in a healthcare setting before you actually enter the nursing program. And then again, you have to have passion. You have to have the passion for nursing and for people and wanting to help and make things better. Um, the nursing program in CT State, there are actually six locations where you can attend a nursing program. That is Capital in Hartford, Gateway in New Haven, Naugatuck Valley is in Waterbury, Northwestern is in Winstead, Norwalk is in Norwalk, and Three Rivers is in, oh, now I just lost the um, Norwich. Just say, I forgot where um, Three Rivers is. So we have six locations. Um, where the nursing program is currently being offered. A little bit about the program. It is a five semester associate degree program. It is one of the selective admission programs. And we have uh, anywhere from 71 to 72 total program credits. There is a number of general education credits in the program. And then there are nursing credits between 36 and 37. And what happens is when you graduate from the program, you are qualified to sit for the NCLEX. That's the National Council licensure exam for registered nurses. And just to give you somewhat of an overview, what a week in the nursing program looks like. You typically have classes, uh, lectures, one to two days per week, four to five hours of lecture. Now, little caveat about that is that that is only nursing courses. So if you have not completed some of the other program courses that are non nursing courses, you would also have additional classes. And then for nursing clinicals, there are two days per week. The times vary by semester. We um, have clinical sites that are all over really the area 
they're all within about an hour's radius of the home campus. Um, but you could be going to different sites every semester. And we do have clinicals two days a week throughout the semester, throughout the program, excuse me. So you start from the first semester and you go all the way through the four semesters of your nursing program and you have clinicals every semester. These are some of the um, admission requirements. You have to have completed an English 1010, the English composition. You also have to have biology, um, sorry, anatomy and physiology plus the biology prerequisite completed, and then also um, the statistics course that has to be completed. And anatomy and physiology, you need a grade of at least C plus or higher. And the other courses, it has to be at least a C or higher um, in order to meet the requirement. Now, I also want to, there's a little note that we will no longer require chemistry as an admission requirement, but you may need to take that because microbiology will require it as a prerequisite. So how does the selection process work? And I know Sarah is going to talk about this a little bit more, but our eligible applicants are ranked. So eligible applicants is and everybody who has met the admission requirements. And then a, a rank is calculated and 50% of that rank is your nursing GPA. So that is basically all of the courses you've taken as an admission requirement and any of the program requirements that you have already taken. Then 25% is the TEAS test, which stands for test of essential academic skills. And it's a standardized test that tests you on your English, math and science knowledge. And then the other 25% is your anatomy and physiology one grade um, that is used to calculate your rank. Now, I do want to say that 75% of all of our applicants or selected selections are um, the ranked applicants. And then we also do a random selection. So the remaining pool of eligible applicants, we select randomly select 25% of all the seats from those um, remaining applicants. The nursing application, well, this is part of the selective admission or admission process, I guess, application process. And the applications open October 1st, and then you have to submit everything by February 1st of the following year. The selection is typically done in April, and then you would start the following fall or spring semester depending on the location. And by that, I mean, um, for instance, Northwestern, we start our program always in the spring. So our students start in January and Three Rivers actually has two start dates. So they have one cohort that starts in the fall and one that starts in January. So it depends on which, um, which program you enter when you would be starting. And what if I don't get in? I, this is always one of those big issues and, um, you know, conversations I have with students. We get many more applicants than we have seats available. So we do have a wait list. Each campus has a wait list. And again, the students are ranked and listed in order of that rank. So if somebody declines their seat that's been accepted, then we go to the wait list and we take students off of the wait list. But I always tell students, have a plan B. What are you going to do if you don't get in? Will you look at your grades and see if there are any courses that you could possibly retake and get a better grade? Could you retake the T's test? Could you look at other career options in the meantime? Maybe you could take some courses and work as a medical assistant for a while. What about health information management? Become an EMT, get some experience or a CNA. There's also central sterile processing pharmacy technician, a medical laboratory assistant. Data science is um, a big field that is now emerging and it has to do with all of the statistics and the numbers and the science involved in healthcare. So I want you to think about what if I don't get a seat, what am I going to do? Um, so basically I've given you a quick overview of the nursing program at CT State. Um, if you have any questions, here's the contact information for the six nursing directors at the campuses that offer the program. Please feel free to reach out if you want more information. 
There is also um, an info packet that it, you can get at the CT State um, website that has a lot of information about the nursing program in there. And with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. Thank you, Connie. <clears throat> so, um, respiratory therapy is it's a great profession, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the role and talk to you a little bit about the program. The role of the respiratory therapist, we're actually frontline responders in the hospital, and I think that really became evident with COVID. Um, we are with the nurses and the physicians seeing every patient that comes in that has a difficulty breathing. So we, um, we assess that patient and we treat that patient. We're responsible for, respiratory therapists are responsible for the ventilators from putting the, from initially putting them on the ventilator, making changes, and then eventually pulling out the endotracheal tube, that breathing tube, and disconnecting, uh, discontinuing the ventilator. Um, respiratory therapists work in the emergency room, patient floors. They work on all the intensive care units, the ICUs, adult, pediatric, and neonatal. There's also new opportunities as an ECMO specialist that um, has um, revolved in the last um, couple of years. So here you have a picture of a respiratory therapist monitoring a ventilator um, patient. And then we have a respiratory therapist intubating a patient. Um, you're trained on how to put that breathing tube in. Um, there's, there are some uh, states that Respiratory therapists will intubate in other states anesthesiologists here in Connecticut. Um, the anesthesiologists will, but in Massachusetts, Florida, and there's others that the respiratory therapists will do the intubation of all the patients. The role of the respiratory therapist as far as we work it with trauma patients. We help um, with diagnosing asthma, COPD, pneumonia, cystic fibrosis, and more. Uh, most of our of the therapists work in hospitals, but then th there's also other areas that they can work in physician offices. Um, they can work in home care, sleep labs, um, pharmaceutical companies, also ventilator companies. As far as when a ventilator is being purchased, a clinical specialist goes to the hospital, trains all the therapists, actually works in the ICU when the patient's first put on the ventilator. So there's so many different things that you can do with the respiratory degree. Uh, but one thing I wanted to say is that being a respiratory therapist, you need to be strong in science and math, very important. You see here a respiratory therapist treating a pediatric patient who is having difficulty breathing. He's taking a nebulizer treatment. The AARC.org, I, I encourage you to go onto this website. This is our national website. It talks about the benefits of being a member um, as far as job listings, news information. It has continued education, a lot of education about the field of respiratory care. It's also a place for networking, professional development, and consumer savings, but there's a lot of information about the field, and I do encourage you to go to that website. The respiratory care curriculum, here it is. So on the left-hand side, you have your English, intermediate algebra or higher, psychology and art, music, or foreign language, and public speaking. On the right-hand side, you have the sciences, concepts of chemistry or general chemistry, either one, Anatomy and Physiology 1, 2, Physics, and Microbiology, all very important to become a respiratory therapist. The fall of 2023 and 24, this is the mission requirements. We're looking at um, English composition of C or greater, um, uh, inter intermediate algebra or a higher al um, math, a C or greater, concepts of chemistry or general chemistry, C or greater. These have to be completed. An AMP, anatomy and physiology one with a C or greater. Um, a T's test, we also require the T's test and a score of 53.3 or higher and it has to be t taken within three years of application. The GPA must be 2.5 uh, for a minimum, but we're scaling it from 2.5 and above. One thing I wanted to note that all sciences need to be completed within five years of the application and have to be four uh, credit lab courses. So a three credit science class will not suffice. We present uh, just one thing, if you just go back, Sarah, one more 
uh, as far as with the fall 2023, we have extended our um, application deadline to May 1st. So if you get all this information in um, by May 1st, including the TEAS test, you may be eligible for a fall of 2023 acceptance. But moving forward for fall of 2024, obviously it's the same. The best case scenario though is to have the English, um, which you see is um, a prerequisite, the English, the math, the chemistry, and the AMP1 um, completed and you have to have that in order to apply. But in order to be able to have physics micro and microbiology, the other two sciences, and maybe psychology, you're in a very good situation because having all the sciences done prior to coming in the program has proven to be um, most successful. So the selection process, we look at the GPA, 2.5 to 4.0, that's 50%. AMP1, anatomy physiology 1, C or greater is 25%. The TEAS test, 53.3 or higher is 25%. And we select 20 students each year. If you are looking um, and want, want some help with curriculum planning, I'm available. The best, there's my phone number as well as my email address. I, said, I always tell people the, the um, email address is definitely um, better than the phone because um, I'm able to get back to you um, more quickly. If you called me right now, I'm doing this session, I wouldn't be able to even answer your, your phone. So if you can please um, email me and I'll get back to you to, um, to set up an appointment so we can plan the curriculum for you. However, you will need to have unofficial transcripts at the time of the appointment unless you're a CT State um, student, um, so they have something to look at to guide you on what you need to take. So upon acceptance of the program, we have a mandatory fr uh, freshman orientation at the end of May. At that time, you will meet the class for the very first time, um, and we go over a lot of things about the program. You're going to be registered for your classes at that time. Uh, you meet someone from student affairs, financial aid, um, at that particular um, session. We, I wanted for full disclosure to let you know that a background check will be needed for the clinical sites. We don't actually start clinical into the spring semester and the hospitals want the background check to be done 30 days prior. So we will not do the background check until the fall. So I encourage you if you have anything in there that you need to clear up, this is the time to do it. So you won't have any trouble um, with that background check. If you happen to fail the background check, you cannot continue with the program because we would not be able to get a clinical site for you. The program itself is a daytime classes, daytime clinicals, two, uh, two years, four semesters, including a summer session. The clinical sites, you're gonna to rotate to various hospitals within um, the Harford area, but we do go to New Haven as well. Um, you're going to be rotating with acute care, rehab, adult, pediatric, and neonatal ICUs. Um, we also will be rotating to Harford Hospital SESI Center for simulations. We're very excited about that new development. We also have, there's also opportunity for student internships at local hospitals, and you also have the opportunity of becoming a respiratory equipment technician while you're in the program. This is, a, this is a picture of Harford Hospital SESI simulation. You can see there's the control room with the computers and then on the other side of that window, which they cannot see in, um, it looks just like um, an emergency room. Once you've completed the program, there is a National Board of Respiratory Care exams. There's two exams that you need to take in order to get licensed as a respiratory therapist. There's the multiple choice exam, which we call the TMC. It's a three hour exam. There's two um, scores. There's the raw, uh, two, the low, sorry, the low cut um, score. Um, if you receive that, you get your CRT credential and then you'll be able to um, get your license in the state of Connecticut. If you get the high cut score, you get the CRT credential and then you can get your license but you also can be advanced to the clinical simulation exam. If you did not get the low, if you got the low cut score, you're gonna to have to repeat that exam to get the high cut score in order to go on to the next exam, which is the clinical simulation exam. There's 24 simulations 
um, on that exam. You're put into different case scenarios, doing some information um, uh, searching, as well as decision making. Once you pass that exam, you get the RRT credential. Most hospitals require you to either have that RRT credential um, prior to employment or within a short time, maybe six months of employment. Some stats about the Manchester campus. Um, we have always been um, very successful with taking these exams. We have a 100% pass rate on the CRT credential, and this program has been around a long time, and we've always had a 100% um, pass rate, which is required for Connecticut licensure. Um, if the, when we look at the RRT success, um, we look at that credentialing um, average pass rate greater than 60, if you have that, um, that score, you get the Distinguished Respiratory Therapy um, Credentialing Success Award, which we, it started in 2016, and we've gotten it every year, and we're continuing to do well in that. Um, we work with our students. They take self-assessment exams while they're in the program. If they're not where we want them to be, we, there's remediation. So there's a lot of uh, help with um, taking these exams. When we look at job placement, we've always, I just gave you from 2019 to 21, um, but also 22, um, we've, we've always had 100% um, job placement. And in that time frame of 19, 21, 20, um, and 21, we've had, um, it should be 20 and 21, we have 100% RRTs. So miscellaneous facts, uh, as far as this program has been around for a long time, like I said, it's been around since the late 60s, 1960s. We have pulmonologists that teach in our program. We're not required to have that, but we have dedicated pulmonologists that love teaching and our students, and we're very happy and proud that they continue to teach in our program. Many of the MCC grads work in many Connecticut and Massachusetts hospitals. Um, some have um, been graduates and have become PAs, so they've gone on to PA school. We've had um, pulmonary PAs, we've had trauma PAs, um, pediatric PAs, surgical PAs. So um, that's an avenue if you if you choose to want to take, um, that's a possibility. But you have to have your bachelor's in order to go into PA school. The students, um, students can transfer to a bachelor's of respiratory care in um, a Bachelor of Science in Respiratory Care at Southern um, Connecticut State University and the University of Hartford. So we have articulations with both, and we can guide you um, to, uh, to go into those programs if you don't have your um, bachelor's already. So these are uh, the coordinators, the program coordinators at the different campuses. Uh, myself, I'm at uh, Manchester, on the Manchester campus. At Naugatuck Valley campus is Betty Joseph Jerome. That's her um, email. And at the Norwalk campus is Mar uh, Maria Grayson, and that is her email so that you can call and ask any questions you may have. And thank you. And I'm going to now um, sign it off to Susan Morrison. She's um, the radiography program coordinator. Welcome everyone to the discussion on radiography. Uh, five of the uh, Connecticut State Community Colleges will be offering radiography. We'll list those campuses for you in a few moments. So the radiography is really the art and science of using ionizing radiation to provide diagnostic images of the tissues, organs, bones, and vessels that make up the human body. If you're interested in the radiography program, your job title will be as a radiographer who is the trained health professional who produces high quality images uh, that are used to diagnose and treat injury or disease. In the lower frame here, you see a radiographer with a device she's holding in her hand called an image receptor. That device actually receives the radiation exposure in the corner here, you see the actual X-ray tube that we use to create the radiographic images. That too, you will be on your feet and interacting with patients throughout your day as a radiographer. It's um, helpful to distinguish though between the professional responsibilities of a radiographer and a radiologist. As radiographers, we are creating that image we cannot 
uh, diagnose that image, that is the responsibility of radiologists who are medical doctors. I have to say that radiologists oftentimes are as good, only as good as the radiographers who do provide those images. But again, our scope of practice does not include diagnosing those images. As a radiographer, though, you're the front line, as Nancy was saying, um, and as Constance was saying for nursing, we interact with patients from the emergency room to the x-ray department, to intensive care units, to the operating room. So we always have to observe our patients and see, make sure that they are stable while they are in our care. There are over 54, that's five, four procedures that you have to learn to perform as a radiographer. That includes, again, if you were to divide the upper extremity into its component parts, fingers are different than a thumb, then the hand, then the wrist, and the forearm, elbow, shoulder. So you can appreciate how it gets to 54 procedures rather quickly. We also have age competencies that include pediatric imaging as well as imaging of the geriatric patient. I've also mentioned you will be involved directly in some operating room procedures as well as moving equipment to the intensive care to image patients who are too ill to come to the department. So all of that equipment, you need to understand circuitry. There is a physics course as part of the curriculum within the radiography program. Now, radiation can be harmful to the human body. So we have to know how to provide the lowest amount of radiation exposure to the patient. That involves math. And the college math that we require for the radiography program is college algebra. There is somewhat of a simple equation, the thinner the body part, the less the radiation exposure you would use, but there are math processes that we teach the students on how to figure that out for each individual patient. Those 54 exams also require that patients are positioned in several different images for one exam. If you've ever had an x-ray, you've probably had two or three images done, either front to back, lying on your side, or maybe turned to the side a little bit called an oblique projection. With that positioning, you have to know then what the specific uh, anatomical structures are that we're looking for in each one of those images. Using ionizing radiation can potentially be harmful uh, for the patients and for ourselves as well. X-rays were first discovered back in 1895 by Wilhelm Rankin, and in the next 125 years, we're actually giving the lowest radiation doses that have been um, provided to patients over those years. That being said, the ladies on the screens are all radiographers, and if we are going to be in a procedure, say in the OR, maybe on portables, doing something called fluoroscopy to see digestive organs, we wear a lead apron that extends from the top of our sternum to our knees during that whole procedure. Additionally, at the neck, we wear something called a thyroid gland. We do have a device called a dosimeter that we can read that dosage that we're receiving on a monthly basis. We do monitor that throughout our lifetime. We also um, monitor our health throughout our lifetime, and there is no greater risk of adverse diseases such as cancer because you are a radiographer. We do have to ask our female patients in the reproductive age group, though, if they are pregnant at the time of the exposure, because the fetus would be more susceptible to radiation exposure. So again, a lot of history that we're getting from our patients before the exam. While we don't diagnose from the procedure, we do have to look at the images before they're sent to the radiologist. So you see here again, a radiographer using an x-ray tube, and you can see that a light is projected down onto the patient's body. So we can always see and ensure that the area we're imaging is correct for the requisition we're provided with. Also, the table that we use floats up and down and side to side so that we can protect our backs as well. 
So here we have a light where we're looking to image the patient's abdomen, but on the screen, you can see a picture on the side of the skull. And then again, not a radiologist, but I can see in this image that there is the femur is broken. I would not be able to share that with the patient though. In addition to working in a general x-ray room, whether it be in the emergency department or in the x-ray department, again, the item on the left is a mobile x-ray equipment that can very easily be moved. There's a simple break there that we just release and can take that onto the elevator and move it to any area in the hospital. There is an x-ray tube that with a series of locks, we can bring that tube up and manipulate in 180 degrees since you never know exactly which bed the patient's going to be lying in when you get to their room. You saw that fractured femur uh, previously. The other item on the right here is called a C-arm. You see that it has two ends to it. And in the operating room, there would be, this would be positioned over the operating room table. And in the back, you can see a console with computer screens. Actually, during the surgery, the orthopedic surgeon or um, the neurologist, the neurosurgeon can actually see live time how the implantation of pins or screws is fixing the pathology that the patient has. We mentioned a fluoroscopy previously, and this is not done often, um, but when the patient swallows barium, a substance called barium, which is the black um, area that you can see here, you would actually see that swallowing mechanism. So we could assess the esophagus to make sure there was nothing wrong with the esophagus. We can evaluate the stomach and we can evaluate the intestines, both small and large intestine. So here you are in the operating room, actively involved with the patient as part of patient care in the first semester in the program. You learn about sterile technique, how to avoid contaminating the sterile field. You do have to wear your scrubs, et cetera, in the operating room environment. And there are clinical competencies that you have to perform when you are in rotation to the operating room. Following the completion of the radiography program, and we will talk about this a little bit more as well, there is a national certification exam that you take to get your credential to be a radiographer. But radiography is another profession where there are just a large number of fields for advancement, including vascular interventional for blood vessels, cardiac interventional, cardiac cath for the heart, computed tomography, sectional images using ionization for all parts of the body, MRI, sectional images, non-ionizing using magnetism and radio frequency, mammography for the breast, sonography or ultrasound, not just to see female reproductive organs or the fetus, but we can image fluid-filled vessels um, or organs, such as the gallbladder, the kidneys and the carotid arteries. You can also do an exam called a bone densitometry done primarily on female patients postmenopausal just to measure the amount of calcium in the bone, evaluate the equipment or images, or with a master's degree, be a radiologist assistant. You can see on the control panels here, multiple images and multiple types of exams being performed on patients. So vascular interventional, uh, the gentleman happens to be the radiologist, the female assistant is the radiographer. We're actually feeding a catheter into the patient's femoral artery and uh, injecting some contrast, not barium, but a liquid contrast. And in the back screen, the Y-shaped area is actually the patient's femoral arteries. And we're just looking for any blockages there. Computed tomography does use an X-ray tube that is in the center of that white donut area in the middle and right image. That X-ray tube does rotate around the patient, 
about 20 individual x-ray images are created, but much thinner sections, as you can see on this image, the white detail is the dense bone of the skull, but then the gray and white matter, the black is cerebrospinal fluid that would be in the ventricles of the brain. All of these areas that we are looking at are advanced level certifications that would require additional education and additional clinical once you completed and were certified in radiography. In MRI, this again uses magnetism and radio frequency, so it is not the ionizing radiation, but you can see that the device itself it has much more depth to it. Sometimes patients do have difficulty with an MRI procedure because of claustrophobia, but we do work through that with the patients to make sure we can get the scans performed. Mammography for the breast, certainly. Um, upon recommendations of your physician, but between 40 and 50, women should be having annual breast exams, mammography, for the detection of breast cancer. We should be aware that um, breast cancer incidence is one in eight women in the United States, and 10% of all people who are diagnosed with breast cancer actually are men. Sonography, so just as I said, even though it's not for the fetus anymore, here is an image of the fetus. I do want to special specify that sonography can be um, completed, a sonography program, without doing radiography first. However, the only campus that would offer that option would be the Gateway Campus, and that would be a two-year program, just like an entry-level radiography program would be. So all five campuses, which include Manchester Campus, Capital, Gateway, um, Naugatuck Valley, and Middlesex Community College, it's a full-time program. Each of these programs start every fall and only in the fall. The classes and academic portions of the program extend for a minimum of five semesters in the program. That includes the initial fall, then spring, summer, fall, and spring. With that schedule, you are in either class or clinical for 35 hours per week. The MCC program, as well as the Gateway program, as well as the Capital program, we actually have the students attend clinical during the winter intercession. So there's a total of seven semesters. During the winter, you're responsible for 60 hours of clinical experience, and that extends in that three week window between December 26th and January 16th, around the time of the Martin Luther King holiday. So where are you going to work? The majority of radiographers do work in hospitals. They're working in the emergency room, they're doing uh, procedures in the operating room, fluoroscopy, but you can also work in physician's offices such as orthopedic offices or all of the walk-in or emergency care centers, urgent care centers usually employ radiographers as well. With a BS degree, you can consider um, working in equipment sales or marketing, being an application specialist for vendors where you could travel um, to different hospitals and instruct individuals how to use new equipment. If you are interested in uh, working as a clinical or academic professor, you would re ha be required to have your master's degree. In the state of Connecticut, the median salary is $63,000. That is for general radiography, which includes the operating room and portable imaging. But if you get that additional training for CT or MRI, that base salary will increase. That is full-time salary. So as the other programs talked about, there are a series of admissions requirements. Our GPA requirement is a 2.70. The prerequisites include English composition with a grade of C, anatomy and physiology one with a minimum of C plus taken within 
five years of application, but by the application deadline for ANP1 of February 1st. Anatomy and Physiology 2, C plus also within five years of your application. R, T's score, which can be in allied health or nursing, is 60% or higher within three years of application, and you should attend a campus-specific information session. As you saw with nursing and also with respiratory, there is specific, there are specific requirements regarding the T-score, your GPA, and your bio scores. The same breakdown, 25% for T-score. Uh, score, et cetera, and so that we have that information from your academic courses. In radiography, we do have a national certification board called the Joint Review Committee on Education and Radiologic Technology. Um, at, you must first be a graduate of one of the campus programs, and then you can apply to take uh, the ARRT certification exam in radiography. The ARRT certification exam does allow you to practice in any of the 50 states. For JRC accreditation, we must uh, maintain, as Nancy was talking about with her exams, a five-year data on our most recent graduating classes. That ARRT exam, can be taken up to three times. You do need a minimum of a 75 to pass that exam. We're fortunate that our first time pass rate is at a 93% and fortunate that upon subsequent taking of the exam a second or third time, we have almost 99% of the students passing the exam. I am confident that that number would be 100% with the exception of one student who failed the first time and chose not to repeat it. That being said, due to COVID um, and many other reasons, the age of the workforce and radiography, there are many, many jobs in the state of Connecticut and other states across the US. So once you pass that certification exam, you're going to be employed and um, you do develop a rapport with the students in your class, with the faculty at the clinical sites. So our program retention rate is at a 94%. Here is a listing of the additional programs. Um, again, Manchester Capital Gateway. At Middlesex, there is both a contact person, Patrick Bryan on campus, and then Donna Crum directly at Manche uh, Middlesex Hospital, and then Mark Martone at Naugatuck Valley Campus. You can only apply to one of these programs, and I do encourage you to go to as many information sessions as you want, because the clinical for each area is geographically around that area. As others said, you may need to travel for clinical, but it's usually within one hour of the site. Each facility has a major hospital at Manchester, Hartford Hospital, which is a level one trauma center, Capital St. Francis Hospital, Julie Austin down at Gateway in the New Haven area, Yale New Haven Hospital. At Middlesex Hospital is a primary site, but Bacchus Hospital in Norwich is also a level one trauma center. And Naugatuck Valley Campus uses the Waterbury Hospital as well. There are additional academic courses that are required to complete your associate's degree. Um, and we do encourage you to complete some of those prior to the application deadline. That helps with the classes that you need to take while enrolled in the radiography program. Thank you so much, Susan. So I just want to wrap up um, with some information related to the application process for selected admissions programs at CT State. Um, when you are ready to apply, you can go to any one of our um, campus websites. Um, soon you'll be able to go to our CT State website and you will create your unique application account. So you start with an application account creation and that uh, account you will use for any future admissions applications. 
second step, you will uh, complete the actual online application and submit it. And um, as Susan said, you um, you may only apply to um, you can apply to more than one selective admission program. However, you cannot apply to more than one of the same program. So in other words, if you were a student interested in both nursing and radiography and you wanted to try to apply to both programs, that would be fine. But you cannot apply to two different campuses for nursing or two different campuses for radiography. Once you apply, you'll want to upload proof of high school completion. This can be in the form of a final high school transcript, high school diploma, or high school equivalency. You also need to submit your immunization records. Um, this is measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella if you were born after 1980. All of this can be uploaded right to your application account. For selective admissions, it's really important to check what the specific um, supplemental items and documents are required for your program. So you heard um, today all three programs, radiography, respiratory care, and nursing, all require the TEAS test. Not all programs require that. Um, some programs require that you have observational hours or shadow hours. Um, for example, for physical therapist assistant, you need 20 hours of observation and half of those have to be inpatient related and half need to be outpatient related. So that's just an example. Some of our programs require an interview. Some require that you um, have personal recommendations, character recommendations, academic recommendations. So every program is unique to what is required um, for admission. Then um, applications are evaluated, but they're not evaluated until after the application deadline closes. So for our degree programs, the fall deadline to apply is February 1. So again, the application opens on October 1st, closes on February 1st. And then for our spring um, programs, the application deadline is October 1. That application would open on June 1 and close on October 1. For certificate programs, they all open at the same time on October 1st, and the deadline to apply is June 1st. So this is just a screenshot so you can see when you actually go in and create your account, you're going to get to the end of the account creation, and it's going to ask you for your area of interest. There are six areas listed, but for all of our selective healthcare programs, you're going to select nursing and health careers. And then for your academic program, you'll select whichever program uh, you know, suits you. In this case, the example is nursing. And once you select your actual program of study, a yellow iframe box is going to appear just like it does here. And it shows you all the requirements to be eligible for that specific program. So again, in this case, we're talking nursing and it lists that you need the A and P1, C plus or greater within five years, A and P2, C plus or greater within five years, this actually can also be in progress during the spring semester of the application year, and that's stated right in the yellow iframe box. Students need the concepts of chemistry equivalent or higher, or a qualifying college preparatory high school chemistry with lab, English composition, C or greater, intermediate algebra, equivalent or higher, C or greater, the nursing admissions GPA of 2.7, and the T score of 58.7 or higher. And again, all items need to be submitted and complete by the February 1st um, deadline unless otherwise noted. And again, this is an example of what's required for nursing, and this was for the fall 23 application, so um, things could change for the upcoming year. It's also important to note that, um, well, I guess that's all, that's all I need to say about that. All right, so financing your education, this is really important. Every student should complete the FAFSA, which is a free application for federal student aid. You'll go to www.studentaid.gov. If you need any help, you can reach out to your um, campus financial aid office, or most of our campuses have a contact EOC representative who can help you with that application process. Um, in addition to that, you may have heard of something called PACT or Pledge to Advance Connecticut. This is also considered free community college. This is a um, this is a state funded grant. It's a last dollar scholarship program, basically. So what happens is any student that's a new first time student who has never attended college 
could be eligible for PACT if you meet these criteria. You need to be a Connecticut resident. You need to have graduated from a Connecticut from a Connecticut high school, GED program or homeschool program. Um, again, you have to be new first time. You have to apply for the FAFSA by, by a certain deadline. You have to have that done by July 15th for the fall semester. You also need to make sure that you um, are have applied, have been accepted, and register for all your classes, again, by that July 15th deadline. And um, if you meet all those criteria, then you could be eligible for PACT. Now, I said it's a last dollar scholarship program. So the way this works is if you qualify for any grant money, federal or state grants through the FAFSA, that will pay first. If you qualify for full, let's say a full federal Pell Grant, you will still get a stipend of $250 per semester for PACT, which will help you with other incidental uh, fees or costs that you have related to your education. If you don't, don't qualify for any uh, federal or state grant money, then PACT will pay your entire tuition and fees for each semester. Um, and you just need to make sure that you follow the deadlines each semester, and you need to make sure that you stay in um, satisfactory academic progress. So you need to be doing well in your classes, not withdrawing, not failing your classes, so that each semester you can earn this uh, packed money. This is good for up to 72 credits or 48 months. So this can help pay for your entire associate's degree or certificate program. Lastly, I would encourage everybody to apply for scholarships. Um, on our website, there's lots of information about where you can apply for scholarship. And uh, most of our colleges have foundations that raise money to help students um, to you know, earn their education. So definitely look into your own campus scholarship program as well. So this really wraps up um, our information session on our three selective programs, nursing, respiratory care, and radiography. Um, we thank you for participating. Again, all the participants, all the, sorry, all the panelists are listed here with names and their uh, title with their email address. So if you need to reach out to um, Annie Hodgkins, nursing director of Northwestern, Nancy LaRoche Chauvac, program coordinator, respiratory care at Manchester, Susan Morrison, program coordinator, radiography at Manchester, or if you have any questions for me, again, director of selective admissions for CT State, um, or you can also reach out to our CT State selective admissions inbox, which is ctstate-selectiveadmissions at ct.edu. And one last thing I just want to mention is that, um, as I said, the closing date for, for applying for the fall is February 1st. Um, then we do our application review. We provide um, those lists of students to our, um, to our program coordinators and decisions go out approximately April 5th. So students will have the option to accept their um, admission to the specific uh, selective program that they've applied to. If a student has applied to more than one selective program, for instance, in my example, if a student applied to both nursing and radiography, and if they were eligible and offered a seat in both of those programs, the student would then have the option to select which program they want to uh, choose and follow through with, and you can only choose one. So I hope that helps. And again, reach out to any one of us if you have questions. Thank you so much.